John Poray Mitchell, uh, he was known as the boy mayor of New York. He was 34 when he was elected. He was actually the, the second youngest mayor ever to be elected. He reflected a lot of people's hopes for what an enlightened reform government could do uh, in uh, the 1910s. And uh, this became one of his problems, is that people thought he was going to be capable of doing much more than he, in fact, was able to do. Uh, known for his reform uh, tendencies, again, uh, to try to uh, push the uh, organization, meaning Tammany Hall, um, to weaken its influence in government. Um, but like most reformers, he only had one term. And he's idealistic. He is uh, somewhat temperamental. He is uh, hot-tempered in a sort of positive way. Because he's idealistic, he's, he's quick-tempered. Uh, he doesn't have, uh, some of the folks who work with him say later, the kind of patience you need to really get inside the system and play a long game in terms of reform. I think Mitchell, for better uh, and ultimately in his case for worse, forged a very interesting political coalition in 1913. Um, he himself was an independent Democrat, uh, was Irish. Um, but he brought together the Republican Party, he brought together reform-minded Democrats, he brought together some socialists. Uh, so he's really the, um, the epitome of this sort of progressive uh, reform tendency. On balance, Poirier Mitchell's office was mixed. He introduced the first budget, comprehensive budget. He introduced the, the nation's first zoning plan in history. He was a, a great anti-Tammany reformer on some levels. Outside of LaGuardia and probably also Abe Beam, uh, maybe one or two others, Mitchell faced uh, the greatest sort of external challenges uh, to his mayoralty. Um, he took office just about the time the national economy was about to go into recession. And this combined with the events in Europe, which were going to lead up to World War I, produced a fiscal crisis in the city, uh, which he had to manage. And as a consequence of that, much of his single term was uh, tightly constrained in, in budgetary terms. Um, so he presided over this era of not quite austerity, but sort of tight-fisted uh, spending. He had some notions that were really uh, rejected by the public. He overly emphasized vocational training uh, in, in the estimation of a lot of particularly ethnic groups in the city. He pushed for universal military training, which was very unpopular at the time. His second two years in office uh, are very much shaped by World War I. And Mitchell himself was a big advocate for American preparedness. Uh, which alienated many, many New Yorkers, Irish New Yorkers, socialists in the city, uh, German New Yorkers, people who were sort of on the other side of this conflict. But the other way World War I came to impinge upon his mayoralty is that it sent uh, prices skyrocketing. There was rapid inflation during the war. And so in 1917, you get bread riots on the streets of New York. Uh, they go marching down to City Hall and demand a response from Mitchell, you know, make prices for food go down. Uh, and he tries, but he's, he's unable successfully to deal with that. Mitchell, who had been swept into office with this very commanding victory in 1913, uh, loses in just about the most spectacular fashion you could imagine in 1917. He's, the Republicans don't renominate him. The Socialists nominate their own guy this time. They had in 1913 also, but this time the Socialist candidate gets very strong support. Um, Mitchell is turned out of office in practically a plebiscite. Um, it's, it seems like uh, to a lot of observers there's been a revolt against the very idea of progressive reform in the city. Uh, and they come indeed to see progressive reform as a class project. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who unlike Wilson, the Democratic president who'd supported Mitchell in 1913, sticks with him the whole way, uh, is in some ways one of the great sort of Mitchell advocates in 1917. He's looking over these election returns and he says the problem was too much Fifth Avenue, not enough First Avenue. And he was viewed by a lot of people as something of a dilettante, that he wanted to spend his time with the elite of the city rather than to concentrate on the concerns of just regular people. The fatal flaw in, um, in most reform mayors is that they don't give they don't give people to, we don't give reason for people to be as enthusiastic in the second term, to vote for them. In other words, it seems to be relatively, not easy, but it's with effort. You can organize 
against a seemingly corrupt candidate from the organization. What's more difficult is because they don't appoint people on the basis of political, presumably on the basis of their um, suitability for whatever job they're doing, then it's hard to get people to vote for them again because the reformers can't turn out the vote. Whereas the organization against them, which is providing turkeys and jobs and all sorts of things for the people, especially immigrants who, are, who go through the, the naturalization process very quickly, they're able to get those people to turn out even in a blizzard because they need work and they're going to get jobs because your side is elected. Election evening 1917 is this sort of uh, searing moment for progressives in the city. Uh, Mitchell's coalition collapses and that ushers in the golden age of Tammany Hall in New York. There's not going to be another anti-Tammany mayor until Fiorella LaGuardia gets elected in 1933. Um, so we're talking about almost two decades uh, of sort of lost time for the progressive cause and it's because they understand that Mitchell has not been able to bring the people along with his project of progressive reform. And uh, LaGuardia with the aid of the New Deal is able to solve that dilemma uh, for progressivism in the city. But um, in the meantime, there's a crisis of faith in the prospects of urban democracy. They say uh, the Mitchell's urban progressive reform project has failed because he couldn't find a way to get the people on board with this project of government by experts. Um, and so progressivism looks to have failed as a consequence of Mitchell's uh, electoral defeat. After Peroy Mitchell left office in 1917, he joined the air service and became a pilot. He was very into the World War I effort. And he was in training over Louisiana six months after he was mayor. And reportedly, you know, they used to do with the airplanes, they, you know, these are things that would practically fly without motors, and so you could make them turn over and do all sorts of things. And he turned his plane over intentionally but unintentionally hadn't tightened his seatbelt. And he was thrown from the plane, plunged to his death, all because he wasn't wearing a seatbelt.